Okay, welcome uh, this afternoon to our very special webinar that we have with Football United and GNT. It's a very special relationship that we're proud to have developed over more than a decade now. So I'm really pleased to be able to bring you um, Anne Bonnebrost and some other very special guests from Football United. But first, I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, um, the traditional owners of the land that we are on. I'm uh, webcasting here from uh, uh, Gadigal land, so acknowledgement to the traditional owners. And a very big welcome to uh, Anne, to Alex and to Alex. I mean, what's better than one Alex? Two Alexes. And we've also got some very special guests from Football United uh, today who Anne will introduce you to. Um, Football United and Gilbert and Tobin got to know each other back in 2008 and they were a relatively small operation running out of the University of New South Wales doing some unbelievably good work with newly arrived refugee kids in Australia. So they support kids from the, they supported kids from the age of 5 to 18, gave them a place to play football. Quite often uh, people coming uh, to Australia as refugees can bring very little of their old life with them. And often football is the only thing that they uh, could bring, having lost family, possessions, and a whole way of life uh, in the country of their birth. Um, and it was really inspiring when we met Anne and her team um, to be able to give kids a foothold in the new world, uh, to be able to make football accessible to them. Uh, because you know, for many people, it's not that easy to turn up at seven o'clock every Tuesday and Thursday with your nice boots and pay pay your fees. So, uh, you know, conventional football was not always a good path for them. And Anne's team made it very accessible, very easy, and gave them a great support network, after school homework clubs, uh, school holiday camps, and we're really proud to have supported the first girls camp that Football United ever held um, up at Narrabeen. Um, since then, they've gone from strength to strength and um, they've uh, signed on some pretty good ambassadors who you'll meet in a minute. Um, and uh, they're also part of a, a global network um, of street football world, which is supported by uh, Common Goal. Now, Common Goal is a thing that I'm actually the chair of, um, which I'm very proud of. It was started by uh, Juan Mata and a number of players. Alex Brosk, uh, who's with us on the webinar today, was actually in the first 11 players to sign on. And these players committed to give 1% of their salary. And for some people, that's quite a lot of money. Um, and that money would go to a fund that supported football development projects that in turn support the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that's the 17 goals the UN have defined uh, for things like clean oceans, gender equality, maternal good health, uh, livable cities, all of the things that we as a planet and a, and a people, uh, as a species really need to get sorted out um, in order to preserve our existence on this planet. Um, hopefully in a, in a better world for our kids and our grandkids. So Common Goal started up a couple of years ago. Alex Brosk um, was a big supporter of that and Football United is one of the programs that Common Goal supports. So a couple of years later, along comes a young Matilda called Alex Chidiak and she's also signed up with Common Goal. And it's pretty amazing actually. I mean, there's some big names from Megan Rapino to Giorgio Cellini, and Juan Mata and Alex Morgan are members. Um, and I'm really proud to say that uh, there's two Matildas, Ivy Lewick and um, Alex Chidiak, who have joined as well. Along with Alex are the three Australian members of Common Goal. Um, Alex has chosen to support another project, which he might tell us about in a minute, but we're really proud that both of the Alexes are Common Goal ambassadors and uh, not only proponents of our game at the very highest level, but also great proponents of footballers uh, for a better society. So um, we're very lucky to have them with us this afternoon. I'm going to hand over now to Anne, who will introduce uh, more about Football United and some of the very special guests that we've got with us, not just here, but also from overseas on the webinar today. Over to you, Anne. Thanks, Moya. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'd also like to follow up uh, Moya's uh, acknowledgement of country and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. 
some of whom I think we may even be working with in Football United. I also wanted to add that um, we're thrilled that the two Alexes are not only Common Goal Ambassadors, but Football United Ambassadors. And Alex Brosk has been such since 2008 as well. So a long time uh, a standing ambassador. Before I introduce our other Football United guests, I wanted to share a little bit of um, background of what Football United has been doing in the past year because um as moya indicated gilbert and the gilbert and tobin family has been supporting us for um a very long time longer than anyone else any other organization and i thought you all might like to just see some highlights from the last year's activities so um i'll start with um an overview here's just a slight overview of what we do with football united um as moya said we run school and community uh playing opportunities special events, but we also have life skills through football and leadership training, and we underpin everything we do with our um, research uh, run out of the university. We also do teaching and a lot of advocacy on um, football for good and its role in building positive societies. Um, this is an overview of Football United in Australia to date. So. Uh, we've reached well over 5,000 young people. We've worked in three different states. We um, have trained a number of youth leaders, more than 50 of whom are actually employed by the program and various times today. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Football United in Myanmar, here's a little overview of what, we, what it looks like. It's the same basic concept of using football to build social change, positive social change, to support personal development. At different times, we've had other themes, HIV prevention and promotion. Uh, peace building is a big theme of the work we do in Myanmar. Um, and we do a lot of research, as you can see here, on impact outcomes, processes, and um, particularly social cohesion and youth empowerment. Um, this is just a little bit of an overview. Our research has been proven to promote optimism, consistent resilience, and positive change in attitudes of young people towards school and community and as a whole, um, important positive sense of belonging, and um, social connectedness as well. Um, these are some of the highlights from uh, Australia's 2019. Uh, we have we always celebrate Global Peace Day. Um, we celebrate uh, this with a big gala day, which brings all of our kids together. We um, also, thanks to Sydney FC, who is a, a another longtime sponsor of Football United, we have a National Harmony Day uh, dedication at the Sydney FC game. You can see in the slide uh, Parade of Nations that our young people do on the field. And generally, we also have a couple of our youth interviewed in pre and post game activities. Um, our regular programs have been running. We run certified coach training. So this is FFA certified. This is also FIFA certified. And um, we run a couple of these a year. Uh, some of our coaches have gone on actually to get all the way up to a B license, which is pretty extraordinary and very challenging as everybody, anybody who's attempted one of the A, B or C licenses can tell you. We um, have a special Strong Women, Strong Girls, um, Strong World program, and we dedicate a lot of activities to uh, Female Football Week, to International Women's Day. And um, this next slide, oh, Wrong order, excuse me. This is another new thing that we did this past year. You can see Alex B up there with us at Miller Technological High School. We've joined a program called the Peacefield Project and we're the first Australian uh, organization to join in with UEFA and the Flanders Field in Belgium, uh, basically honoring our work towards building peace and we have a nice plaque that's at the school and Miller now has one of its fields dedicated as the peace field which is pretty exciting. Um, we have run for the past two years an international young women's uh, sports women for change leadership program sponsored by the Australian government brought bringing um, 
young women from Arabic countries to Australia for a week of uh, sports women for leadership, female football work, Galladay and Gilbert and Tobin also. Every year hosts a panel discussion, opens it up to the entire firm and to members of the public. And then we also brought everybody out to the Sydney FC game. So you can see some quotes from some of our international delegates. It's a really successful and super positive week. Everybody on a personal level just gets so much out of it, as well as a lot of really significant skills building. Um, moving on to Myanmar, here is uh, this visual is really, really exciting for us. We got some fund some funding in 2018 to dedicate to build a community center for football for peace. And you can see pictures up there of an art, uh, an artist rendition of what the center looks like. Um, and some of our young people who were involved in our first annual uh, youth forum in Myanmar, where we bring our youth coaches from across the country together for a couple of days of continued education and training. And the center actually opened up this year um, no, I'm sorry, in 2019, in February. And I just want to draw attention to the visual at the bottom of the screen, this man here who is uh, blessing the ground along with some others. This is Dr. Tunong Shui, who is the director of all of our work in Myanmar. And he's a panelist, uh, he's a member of our group today. Um, I just want to put hats off to this extraordinary man. He has reached almost the entire country with Football for Good in Myanmar, and it's just going from strength to strength. So um, he deserves a really extraordinary acknowledgement. If you all want to clap at home, you can clap. Um, <laughs> so in Myanmar, we run the same kinds of programs. We're aligned with universities. We're working with 16 universities. We're also working with the National Ministry of Social Welfare, which is real extraordinary feat, and we're doing some, ex some really incredible work there. Among the highlights there um, also, uh, we have done some social enterprise training because our, and this is our, this is our Peace Center, uh, one of our rooms at the Peace Center up in the top of your screen. Um, we are running this as a social enterprise and the idea behind that is for us to be able to eventually bring in our own funding so that the program can be 100% sustainable in the event that outside funding ever um, goes down. Um, it's also very cool that we actually have a vehicle, Football United vehicle. So everywhere we drive in Myanmar, people hear about Football United. Uh, we've been doing coach educator training, community development training. We are now, um, we are now actually employing 18 of the young people who started as coaches in a variety of ways. We have young people getting trained up in monitoring and evaluation, financial planning, um, program management. So it's pretty extraordinary. And I'm leading on to one of the most extraordinary experiences any of us have ever had. And this is last year during the Women's World Cup, which was held in France. And for the first time ever, an international festival for good was held during the Women's World Cup. Both Football United Australia and Football United Myanmar were there. We had a youth delegation from Football United Myanmar up here. Um, they, uh, we had five members of our organization from Myanmar who were sponsored by the French government to go to uh, Lyon and spend a week of youth leadership training, football for good playing, um, we all participated in a thing called the Equal Playing Field Guinness Book of World Records. This was the longest five-sided game ever in the history of football. And um, I just want to say that Moya and Natasha and No, who is our youth leader from Myanmar on the line, we were all in this together. So this was extraordinary. We had Football United Myanmar, Football United Australia. We had Moya and her family. Um, even a couple members of my American family came over. So, and my niece was the youngest on the field, I think. So it was really extraordinary stuff. It was an amazing opportunity for, um, for everybody involved, it was inspirational. Women's football is just on a whole new level, thanks to Lyon and all the hard work everybody puts in. 
And um, Moya and I actually also got to be joint panel members on a, um, a presentation that the women were um, the women were uh, the women participants in the festival were doing. Uh, there were a lot of stars. It, it was the most amazing football, and the final was incredible. So this was absolutely um, extraordinary. And I just want everybody to keep their fingers crossed that Australia gets the bid for 2023 because. If they do, we're going to put on a better show in Australia in 2023. So um, one more little slide quickly. Um, COVID didn't stop us. And this is extraordinary. We had Instagram live sessions. We had video recorded coaching sessions. We had Facebook communications, including live broadcasts, podcasts, video coach training down at the bottom of the screen. These are two of our Myanmar coaches who filmed their training uh, program and then this was taken out to the young people. So it was incredibly inspirational and our teams worked round the clock to make sure that we could continue offering all of our great work to uh, our participants. So here's how you can find us and I'm sure that um, all you have to do is Google Football United and you can find us. So um, I'm going to end the highlights now and stop sharing, hopefully. Yay, it worked. <laughs> now I'm going to have to ask the support of our, um, our lovely behind the scenes ma management guy because right now I'd like to introduce you to two extraordinary young women. Um, one uh, young woman, uh, Natasha Hill, who is our community coordinator here in Australia. Um, is it possible for us to bring Natasha to the screen? Yeah, um, you add. There's Natasha. Hello, Natasha. How are you? Good, Anne. How are you? <laughs> I'm fantastic and thrilled that you could join us on this. Um, Natasha, you're our community coordinator. Can you just share with everybody um, your journey with Football United um, and how you got to where you are today and then a little bit about what you do? Yeah, um, so I joined Football United in 2012 um, upon seeing a Facebook post that wanted more female coaches uh, for a specific program that they were running at Chester Hill uh, Intensive English Centre. I had no coaching experience whatsoever at the time, um, however, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd give it a shot. Um, and I've just gone from strength to strength then. So from being an assistant coach um, and learning from the ranks of Stuart um, and a few others already, uh, asthma um, and so on, I've progressed through the past eight years um, to become now the commu community coordinator, which I took on the role in 2016, um, as well as the events coordinator and also one of the head coaches and coach educators uh, for Football United. Um, I've done my C license just this year um, as well with Football New South Wales to add onto my football resume, if you want to call it that, and to also benefit Football United um, and my community outside of my work organization too. Uh, thanks, Natasha. Um, you're way more than a coach, and I'm not belittling being a coach, but tell us a little bit more about all the other million things you do for Football United. Um, so across the years, I've also facilitated many of the workshops, many of the sessions that we do, mentored a few of the young people. Um, I've been blessed to be to be given the opportunity to head overseas um, and represent Football United in South Korea, Valencia, um, Lyon, Paris, uh, Russia, alongside the, the World Cup there as well. Um, recent being in Lyon last year, um, as Anne showed previously with the Street Football World alongside the Women's World Cup. So myself and my colleague Asma um, were two of the three facilitators that ran workshops to the 50 young women, uh, young leaders of, from 30 different countries before the participants arrived um, at the Street Football World 19 Festival. Um, we're pretty much the, the core values that we were trying to deliver were make a change, make a connection, um, and make your mark, which encompassed the whole um, week of the, the Street Football World Festival 19. And you also are responsible for making sure that all the programs run 
uh, on time, that all the young people get to all the program sites, that all the camps get set up properly, et cetera. So um, just for the listeners, Natasha has an absolutely huge job. Can you tell us a little bit, because you actually led with Stuart, our um, transfer from face-to-face -to, -face to all this cool online stuff I was just sharing. Do you want to share a little bit about how that's going and are we transitioning back yet? Yeah, so, so at the moment, for the past three months, we've been running online. Uh, the first month was kind of organizing what we're going to do and where we're headed um, over this this period. So we've gone from delivering online, oh, sorry, delivering face-to-face -face sessions to now delivering online sessions. So making sure that we encompass both the life skill and the football skill, um, creating little three to five minute short videos, putting it out there for students and participants to, um, to view, to use, uh, and to hopefully do the, in their own space, in their own backyards. Now that football has been given the green light to head back, um, these sessions will be used, um, we'll, keep, we'll store them aside for future um, use. But then also at the same time, we were working on a bit of coach education. So revamping our curriculum um, and making sure that all our youth coaches were on the ball with it um, and just allowing them the space to learn and grow at the same time. Um, also allowing our young leaders or young people to be part of those Instagram lives and those legendary conversations that we've been holding um, to give them, to allow them to have a voice um, and to help shed light on what this, the, the story that they have and what they've been through um, and their journey also with football United. So we've got a few young coaches as well that are still in school um, that we've allowed them to share that story with uh, others as well online. Fantastic, thanks so much. Um, we could talk forever, but let's move on now. Um, if we could bring uh, No, uh, Tenno, hey. who, hey Ten, how are you? Good. So Ten is one of our um, coaches in Myanmar, who, and she also uh, represented Football United in Lyon. Ten, can you share a little bit about your experience in Lyon with our listeners? Yeah, I have the chance to attend Festival 90 as a young you leader in France, and I learned a lot of new things from Festival 19, such as Women Leadership Workshop and Football 3 Festival. Uh, that opportunity made me improve a lot because it was my first time traveling alone and I met new people from different countries and work together with them. I share my knowledge and talk about Football 3 at Football United Youth Forum 2020 and held Football 3 Festival for Fairly, I also shared Football 3 for new coaches attending online coaching course. Fantastic. Can you just share a little bit in your day-to-day -day work in Myanmar, what is your role now? Yeah. So United Myanmar is now currently implementing three projects and we're starting two new projects soon. Due to COVID-19, we work from home using Zoom, email, and phone call. We are now giving online coaching course using Google Classroom and will deliver Facebook based course later when restriction are removed. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else you would like to share with our Australian listeners? Nothing. <laughs> 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 we hope that you come to visit Australia one day and we hope to take some of our Australian friends to Myanmar to meet you. Yeah, thank you. I went. <laughs> Thanks so much, No. Back to you, Moya. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, and thank you, uh, Natasha and Tan No, for it. It's been great to hear from you as well. Um, so during the course of this hour, you will get to ask questions. So if you have a question, there is a little thing called Q&A and you should put your question in there. Um, uh, you can direct it to a particular person or to the panelists generally, probably easiest if you just send it to the panelists and we can all see it. Um, so please uh, feel free to start propping your questions in, whether they're for Football United or whether they're for an Alex. Um, and, um, so we're going to go by way of uh, kind of an in fun introduction. We're going to have a little uh, quiz. So if Julian could put the poll up, 
on the right hand side of your screen, you should see a poll about which Alex. Um, we've got a few questions there. The first one, which Alex debuted against New Zealand as an 84th minute substitute? Alex Chidiak or Alex Ross? Feel free to click in your answers as we go. Um, which Alex's mum used to eat her lunch in the school toilet so she wouldn't be picked on for being different? Tough story, but not an unusual one for migrants to Australia. Number three, which Alex has played the most games for Australia at under 20 level? Alex Brosk or Alex Chidiak? Which Alex has played the most games for Australia at senior level? That's question four. Drop your answer in. Question five, which Alex was playing in Japan during the earthquake and tsunami? Uh, that was a while ago, but I'm sure we all remember those times. Um, Alex Brosk, Alex Chidiak or Alexander the Great? It's gone for a wander. Uh, question six, which Alex was involved in a Spanish Cup game with a world record attendance? I'm not kidding. We might hear a bit more about this later. Which Alex was born in Sydney? Which Alex just had a baby? There could be some trick questions in here, just saying. <laughs> Which Alex joined Common Goal to give 1% of their salary to football development projects? So if you've put your answers in, uh, hit submit. And uh, we'll just give you another few seconds to do all that. And then Julian will close the poll and we'll get to see what you thought. Okay, maybe we can close the poll now, Julian. And we should be able to see the answers that you gave. I don't know if they're the right ones or not, but they should pop up on the screen. In any event, I'll tell you. Alex Chidiak debuted against New Zealand as an 84th minute substitute. Um, uh, always special to come on against those Kiwis. And of course, they are now our partners in the World Cup bid for 2023. Not many of you got that right. Um, which Alex's mum? used to eat her lunch in the school toilets? Well, it was Alex Brusk's mum. And we might hear a bit more about that story of his parents' journey arriving in Australia and his, his experience as a kid being here as well. Which Alex has played the most games at under 20? That's Alex Chidiak. She's played 22 games and scored 17 goals. I did see her get a hat trick for Australia once uh, in a youth game, which was pretty good. Uh, which Alex has played the most games at senior level? Well, as at the moment, it's Alex Brosk with 21 games and five goals. Um, Alex Chidiak's got 17 games and one goal, but um, she's a bit younger, so we might be seeing her add to that tally, I hope. Uh, which Alex was playing in Japan during the earthquake and tsunami? Well, I hope it was Alex Brosk because Alex Chidiak was, I think, at primary school at the time. Um, uh, and it was indeed Alex Brosk who was playing for... Shimizu S Pulse at the time, uh, pretty traumatic times in Japan. And you might remember their women's team won the World Cup a few months afterwards, which was a very emotional occasion. Okay, this one, question six, I love this one. Which Alex was involved in a Spanish Cup game with a world record crowd? Well, um, most of you got this right. It was Alex Chidiak. Um, she was a star uh, when Atletico Madrid, she plays in La Liga, uh, Femenino. So Atletico Madrid, her team, was playing at home against Barcelona. And 60,739 fans came to watch. And I'm going to try and do something a bit clever here. I'm going to try and share my screen because I've got a picture for you. Um, no, it's not letting me do it. Well, it's on Google anyway. There are some absolutely amazing pictures of the um, wand. Oh, wait a minute. I think uh, I'm now able to share my screen. Here we go. Okay, are you getting that? I hope you're seeing a picture of the stadium full of people. So Alex Chidiak is out there somewhere. Lucky her. That's all I can say. Um, and that was a world record crowd for a women's club game. And that, that was world record was set um, 
last year in March 2019. So pretty special. Um, which Alex was born in Sydney? Trick question. Both of them were. Alex Chidiak moved to Adelaide when she was three months old, so she calls herself a South Australian like I do. Which Alex just had a baby? Well, that was Alex Morgan. So that was a trick question. Alex Morgan, the US Women's National Team uh, co-captain who lifted the World Cup uh, just last year, had a baby a few months ago. Which Alex joined Common Goal? Well, both of them. Um, they're among 150 players globally to belong to Common Goal. So that was your introduction. Thank you all for participating. Um, a few of you got the questions right. I think they were more right than wrong. So, so good on you. Nobody chose Alexander the Great, I think. So, so that's good. Um, a special welcome to, to the kids who are on the call. We've got quite a few people whose families have joined them. Uh, we held this at 4.30 in the afternoon uh, Eastern time so that hopefully some of your kids could join in. And I've actually got a question here already from one of the kids. But before we go to that, I just wanted to throw to each of the Alexes, uh, maybe Chids first and then Broski afterwards, because, you know, we can't call them Alex because they'll get confused. So their friends call them Chids and Broski. So their friends are all of us right now. So um, maybe I'll throw to you first Chids and then Broski just to tell us a little bit about how you did during COVID, um, what you're up to and, and what you're doing now. Over to you, Chids. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Um, yep. Yes, I was I was in Spain when when COVID hit, and I spent I think it was three weeks in lockdown, um, and that was pretty much I was just with my roommate, which is the only person that I saw every day. So we were training every every day indoors. We had a program from our team, um, and yeah, so that was just training every day. And then after three weeks, I made the decision to come back to Australia. So it took quite a while. Um, there was not a lot of flights available, so. I think my my journey in total it took me two days to get back to Australia, and then as soon as I landed, I was in a hotel for two weeks. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I brought a little foam soccer ball with me though, so I was able to kind of train in the hotel room uh, for a little bit. But yeah, definitely got a little bit um, went a little bit crazy just doing the same thing every day. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, since then I've been out and about, been able to do some volunteering work, been able to connect with um, well, Football United for one, um, and also the organisation that I support through Common Goal um, over in Kenya. So that was really great to have a chat with them. And yeah, because I've, I've been injured as well, so I was able to go get um, an injection in my ankle and start my rehab program. So now I'm back running. So a lot of my life has been training to get back to playing football. So that's kind of what I've been doing during COVID. Uh, tell us a little bit about your common goal project in Kenya. What's that all about? Yeah, so they're, um, they're called Moving the Goalposts. And basically what they do is they use football to overcome social obstacles girls and young women face in coastal Kenya. Um, they create like a safe space for them to understand their rights, claim them and have a voice. Um, so it wasn't really easy just to pick one organization to support, but I did a lot of research into them and I was able to read a lot of the girls' individual stories and I kind of just connected with them um, on a different level. And I thought that, yeah, I just really wanted to, to support them. And I've also always wanted to go to, to Kenya as well. So that's, I have even more of a connection now and we're trying to organize a trip over there too. So. Yeah, I think it's just really great what they're doing over there. And um, it's quite sad how hard they've been hit by everything. And I think the um, the person that started it, her name's Dorcas, and she's had to individually call all of the girls every day because there's no, they don't have um, access to, to internet to understand what's going on or to, to know what's going on around the world at the moment. So they've been individually calling them to, to give the girls updates and and all of that. So I've been trying to kind of do as much help as I can from from over here. But it's yeah, it's definitely really hard. You're up to now. We all remember you ripping it up at the Sydney Football Stadium and giving us a show, banging in goals over over many years and winning a lot of trophies with Sydney FC. Um, and we miss seeing you on the field. Tell us, tell us what life's like on the other side for you. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely very different. I mean, as I've, I've played football since I was, um, you know, three, four years old. My dad used to play when, when, um, 
when he was able to run around and, and uh, as a younger guy. And then so as soon as I was able to, he, um, you know, got me a pair of boots and, and got me playing. So for me now at 36, which is when I retired, um, it's basically all, all I ever knew. And, and, um, you know, my life to, to, you know, a, a huge extent, it was, um, a big part of my life and to have to stop that all of a sudden, um, was definitely, um, yeah, very, uh, eye opening and very challenging, but, um, look, I think like anything, if you have a good family support network and, and friends who can assist you through those times, uh, I spoke to a lot of players before I decided to retire on what that transition is like, and they all helped me as well. So I've actually really uh, enjoyed this last 12 months since, um, you know, since I last kicked the ball, it's given me a chance to, as footballers, we, um, you know, we, we miss out on a lot of things, uh, a lot of family um, events and um you know get togethers with uh, with a lot of people that that we care about so i think as a um you know person who's retired now from football it's given me that chance to to do that now reconnect with um family friends um and just basically be around for things that as a player i wasn't able to do so this this past 12 months has been quite enjoyable obviously up until a few months ago when um you know these awful sort of times begun with COVID and 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 you know took a hold around the world but um, look, I think the one positive that we can take from something like this is exactly what it's done. You know, it's sort of brought everyone closer to, the, to their families. It's allowed, it's opened our eyes to things like what we're doing right now, you know, just connecting with um, meetings on, on the internet to, to different people around the world and, and being able to connect in different ways to, you know, as we start to move out of this, um, you know, progress in ways that we probably couldn't before. So. Yeah, I'm looking forward to what the next few months um, brings from my end. Um, you know, having been involved with Anne at Football United, um, you know, many, many years ago um, and now joining Common Goal as well. I think now being retired, I'm, you know, able to take a bit more of an active role in that and, um, you know, help out and, and do my little bit uh, as opposed to sort of just coming to to present some you know, trophies and certificates and see the kids, it's actually maybe getting a bit more hands on and, and, um, and join in a bit more. So I'm looking forward to like the rest of the world coming out of this situation and, and, and using it to, you know, to progress. And uh, we heard a little bit of a, a story there about your mum. Uh, and I know your parents came here from Uruguay uh, when they were youngsters. Do you want to share a little bit of uh, that story of their transition into a new country and how that was for you as a kid growing up here? Yeah, well, I was I was born here, but my parents, they came from Uruguay when they were both uh, in their early teens. So um, there were a lot of immigrants coming from from South America and different parts of the world into Australia at that time around the, you know, the 70s, um, 60s, 70s. And um, it was difficult for them. You know, I, I like it is for a lot of immigrants coming to Australia. You know, you don't know the language. You don't know how to get around. You're basically uh, back then, you know, they were they bought a ticket and didn't know what was waiting for them on the other side. And, and, and it was difficult for them moving around the country. Like I said, they didn't speak the language. Um, and my mum and dad both were put into schools, um, you know, and, and it was tough for them because they couldn't really uh, connect with a lot of the students not knowing the language. So that story about, you know, there's a lot of stories, both from my dad's side and my mum's side on, on the toughness that they, that they faced. And, um, you know, that was one of the unfortunate, sort of stories and, and things that my mom had to go through. But I think all those things, um, you know, ultimately, you know, um, you know, help you as a person, help you grow, help you develop, help you understand, um, you know, the different cultures around the world. And I think Australia probably at that time as well, wasn't as open um, to immigrants as what they are now. I think we're such a multicultural country now that, um, you know, everybody that comes here basically is, um, is given an opportunity and, and supported um, but it definitely wasn't like that back then. So that, um, you know, for me growing up, it was definitely different to, to what my parents uh, had to go through here. But um, again, it's always good to know those stories and the things that they went through, um, you know, because it helped shape them and it helped sort of develop um, them as people and, and, and then, you know, in turn sort of shape our lives and what they wanted, um, you know, for the, for the lives of their children. Yeah, for sure. Um We've got a question here actually for uh, for you from Kitwala, who says, uh, she's the daughter of one of our GNT staff, Stephanie. Um, and Kitwala would like to know, how long did it take you to get selected to Sydney FC? 
Um, well, that's a um, sort of hard question to to answer, but I'll I'll, I'll keep it simple. Basically, because the... you've got a dirty secret, haven't you? You used to play for Brisbane Raw. I well, see that's right. That. That's right. It, it, um, <laughs> yes, exactly right. I was overseas. Um, the A League started, I think, in two thousand and five. So prior to that, I was playing in in the um, you know what was called the the NSL, which was at the time Australia's um, highest you know football competition, and then. Um, there was a year where the league, um, it didn't quite fold, but there were, you know, a lot of changes in the Australian game and they were looking at setting up the A-League. So I used that opportunity to, to go overseas and, and play in Belgium for a season and see how I'd go. Um, and it didn't, you know, pan out as I, as I hoped. And, and after a year, I was looking um, at coming back. The A-League was starting and pretty much every team was, um, was full at the time and, and Queensland Raw were the only team that still had a spot available. So I went uh, went for a week train with them and then signed for a year. And then um, it was during that year that um, Sydney FC approached me to, you know, to sign for them and, and being originally from Sydney and, and a Sydney boy, I, yeah, I, I, you know, took that as a good opportunity to move back home and play for my home team. But so, yeah, that's, that's how it came about. Right. Great, um, and Alex Chidiak, we we uh, I hope people saw that image of uh, the stadium full of people, your home your home uh, ground, uh, the big home ground of Atletico Madrid. Um, tell us a little bit about how that came about that you were there at the record crowd match for women's football in a club game ever in the world. I mean, how did you finish up in Spain? Um, and then how did that match get a, a record crowd? What what was special about it? And are all your crowds like that over there? Yeah, no, definitely not all the crowds are like that. Hopefully one day. Um, but I guess how I got to Spain in the first place, I was kind of lucky in a way. Um, one of my closest friends, um, Ivy Lewick, who's also a part of Common Goal, she, um, we are talking about, because I've always wanted to go play overseas. Um, this was two years ago now. And she said that she had a really good agent. Um, so I got in contact with him and we had a really long chat one day and he said like, he thinks that Spain would be a good fit for me. And um, basically he just started kind of getting my name out there a little bit. I made a really dodgy highlights video of myself that he was sending around. And um, I, I don't know how it happened, but somehow Atletico Madrid were interested and obviously I couldn't really pass up that opportunity. So that's how I um, ended up there. I didn't really know much about um, the, the women's side of the club, but I just knew that I had to go. And yeah, I think how that game came about, um, one day at training, all of us got told that we were gonna be playing in, in Wanda. Um, and obviously we're all extremely excited about that, but I don't think anyone knew how big it was actually going to be. Um, so they, they started like sharing some of the numbers and we thought 20,000 was a lot. We were just like, oh, wow. And then it just kept going up and up and up. And it, honestly, we don't know how it all happened and everyone was, quite surprised on the day that it was it was sold up out but I mean it was just such a it was so insane like I can't I can't describe it and just walking out there and um it was exactly like you see on tv with the the men's games in Atleti where the whole crowd are singing and you know you know you know all the songs but they're singing like you know the women's um the names of our, all of our teammates and everything and it was just like electrifying in there even though we didn't end up beating Barca um it was still such an amazing experience for, for everybody that day. But it was a top of the table clash, wasn't it? It was you were yeah. first and Barca was second. On yeah, the day. yeah, it was top of the table. We ended up winning the league still, um, which was great. <laughs> but yeah, we didn't beat Barca that season. I think we only beat them in the cup, but but yeah, we ended up winning. They got some pretty big players though, as well, like Lika Martins and uh, they, they got some big names. And, and uh, you're in the Champions League still? Yeah. Uh, your team's in, still in the Champions League. We're not quite sure when it's going to be played, but you're still there? Yeah, still there. We've got Barca in the quarterfinals, but, yeah, we have no idea when that's going to be played. Still waiting. Yeah, yeah that's pretty tough. Um, I've got another question from Orlando, which is, uh, who's your favourite teammate? Broski, do you want to have the first go at this one? Give Alex a little, give Chids a little bit of time to think about it. <laughs> My favourite teammate. Um, I've probably got a few. Uh, I mean, just guys that I room with before. So I'm going to say um, 
Well, David Carney is definitely one. I, I went to school with David actually when, uh, so we went year seven, year eight, year nine, and a bit of year 10 together. We went to Westfield. So um, I've known him for, for a very long time. And then he, um, he went overseas to England to play, but we, we stayed in touch. Um, and over the years, we ended up playing together again in the, uh, in the national team. And then he came back uh, to Australia and we, and we played our last few years together in, in Sydney and we continue to be really good mates. Um, I saw him today for lunch actually, and I'm seeing him again tomorrow for a, a game of golf, but, um, He's probably my my favourite teammate just because he's still such a since year seven since we're 12, 13 year old kids we've um, you know been so close and been able to you know spend different and go through have different journeys through football but um, still remain so close and and start together and then end together so it's pretty unique what we what we had and what we still have so he would he would be my favourite. Chits, what about you? I actually answered this one privately back to Orlando, but I'll, I'll say it for everyone. Um, it's no surprise. Um, mine's definitely Ivy Lewick. She's she's been uh, well started off as a mentor and then kind of became my older sister. Um, and yeah, she's always been there for me through through everything. And she's yeah, uh, honestly, like I I can't speak highly enough of her. So yeah, she's a terrific person, Ivy. For those of you who haven't followed her career, she was in the Matildas back in 2010 when they won the Asian Cup. And she sort of drifted off the scene a little bit. She never got to go to a, a World Cup uh, or an Olympics with the team. And she got the call up um, in 2019 for France and she got to go on and represent Australia at the World Cup there. And she's in her, she's probably 34 now, I think. So I think, I guess she thought she'd missed the boat at some point, but she's one of those players who's um, just always been there in the game, been incredibly dedicated and, Everything I hear about her, she's, you know, if there's a young player in the team who's feeling a bit unsure about themselves, she's always the one who is there with her arm around them to, to help them fit in and, and bring everyone along with her. She's the ultimate team player. So big props to her, another common goaler. Um, we have another question. Um, who is the hardest team you've ever played against? Broski, do you want to have a go at this one? Hardest team you've ever played against? Um, I'm going to... I'm going to say, I saw that pop up, so I've been trying to think about it. I think there's there's probably a couple. I think um, uh, we we at Sydney we've been very fortunate over the last few years to have some awesome friendly matches. We played against uh, Liverpool, Arsenal, Tottenham, and Chelsea all within a couple of years. And I'd say that probably the hardest player um, and best player would definitely have to be uh, Hazard, who's now I'm pretty sure at Real Madrid. He was. Um, he was just incredible. I mean, you see it, you watch him on TV, but to be on the same field and trying to get anywhere near him and just seeing how easy he, he it, it seemed to him like he was just playing PlayStation with us. It was so easy for him and, and incredible to, to watch. But best team, I'd say, we played against the team uh, when I went to the Olympics in Athens. Uh, we played against uh, Argentina and they... They won the competition. They didn't concede a goal in the whole competition, and um, and they were just phenomenal. They had you know players like uh, Carlos Tevez, Mascherano, um, incredible, incredible team. I mean, players that were playing at the best leagues all over the world. Their entire squad was ridiculous, and um, and it was such a such a good team. So that was that's probably the best team I've ever played against. Must be hard for a Uruguayan to say the Argentines were the best team. <laughs> it definitely is. But look, I think. Uh, as someone who sort of respects just how good people, you know, can be when, when they are peers, um, it, it was incredible. Yeah. To see, um, like I said, to line up against some of these guys, let alone play against them at, at a competition like that was incredible. And they were just, they were just miles ahead of everybody else. Amazing. I seem to remember you ripping up the Argentines when they were out in Australia. Um, uh, before the world cup last year, they came out here for some friendlies. And I seem to remember you, I'm not, uh, yeah, you were carving them up in midfield. I think I think I recall. Yeah, um, of they're probably not the they're probably not the hardest team you've played against. Who, who's the hardest team? I think for me, the hardest team um, came back when we I think it was 2018 World Cup qualifiers for under 20s. Um, we played against Japan. Oh, we were we were one nil up, and we were was so exciting. So I don't think we've ever beaten Japan, and then we ended up losing five one. They just, <laughs> they were ridiculously good. Um, just all of them were on the same level and the, the, the technical ability was, was on a different level to all of us. So 
yeah, that was definitely the hardest team that I've played against. We got another question about what's the most important skill for a young player to learn if they want to play for their country. Um, I'll, I'm going to have a go at this first while you two have a think about it. Uh, I actually think that what happens is there's an awfully lot of there's an awful lot of very very talented players who look great as kids, and um, and but but the things that count the most. But the problem with that, I guess, is that it's always easy for the really talented kids and they're always better than all the other kids in their team. So they don't always get pushed as hard as they should. So that pushing has got to come from inside you. You've got to always be finding a way to be better. And often it's the things that don't that take no talent, that take zero talent, which help you be better. Right. So it takes zero talent to show up on time. It takes zero talent to have your boots with you and have your gear all sorted out. It takes zero talent to do the physical training and conditioning that you're told to do. You don't need any talent to run around the block or go to the gym and pull some weights. That doesn't take talent. That just takes discipline and application. So I would say it, those, those zero talent things are the things that you need to do really well because only then can you make the best use of your talents. And there's a lot of very, very talented people who never make the most use of it because they they don't apply themselves to the full. So that would be my answer. But um, Broski, you want to have a go and then Chits? Look, that was pretty much perfect. I think um, there, there's not one specific skill that that you can be better at anyone else at um, that, that gets you to the national team. I think it's the things that sort of get you to becoming a professional footballer, which are those um, things like the, your dedication, your um, attitude, you're willing to, to want to learn and, and become a better player. Um, that, you know, that, those are the things that get you there. I think once you're a professional, um, you know, if you're playing well um, and performing and, and doing well at a certain time, those sorts of things are what get you selected into the national team. But um, look, at that level as well, generally most players um, are quite good. So I think there, there's, there's, it just comes down to form at the time. But for me, like Moya said, it's the things you do um, and the things that uh, stand you out as a as a young kid um, in terms of your dedication and and your uh, determination. Those sorts of things that are what make you become a professional player. They're the things that um, ultimately, if you continue to play well and and do well, you you know will hopefully be lucky enough to to play in the national team anyway. Chits, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, you guys summarised it very well there, but. Um, I think something that I've I've learned, obviously I'm I'm still at the beginning of my career and kind of transitioning from from that stage of of being a young player. Um well, I'm still I'm still young, but anyway, um basically I think it is that mental side of the game that that's kind of goes underrated a lot. Like you I think for throughout all my career I was kind of always making teams and comfortably like playing and um I felt very confident, but then as soon as going overseas I kind of got a lot of perspective on on everything and it kind of hit me hard and I wasn't playing so much and even now being injured um there's a lot of things in the background that you don't see and it's kind of that fight to keep going um so I think it's it's a really it becomes a mental game and it's more kind of being aware of that and making sure you know you know yourself you know your values all of that those kind of things become really really important as you get older and in your career as well so I think um that's probably something that is going to help you if you do want to continue to push in your career and then eventually make make national team. But I mean, another thing for me is just enjoying the game and loving the game. It's not really, it's not really a skill, but it does kind of get lost um, with the seriousness of everything that comes around. I think that that's something that happened to me. I kind of got a little bit lost of always wanting to try and achieve things. And I got lost that I just, I really love playing football at the end of the day. So that's kind of what brought me here in the first place. And I just want to continue to play and enjoy it. So yeah. I think that's about that's about it. It is tough, isn't it? Because as you say, you know, if you're a good player, you're probably getting picked first in your club team and maybe even in your state team and rep teams. So you're always you're always getting a game. You're always in the first eleven, and then all of a sudden, when you when you get to a certain level, you're not in the first eleven. You're sitting on the bench, and it's a whole different skill to be able to be a good supportive player for the rest of your team, and then to come off the bench and have an impact and and you don't really learn that along the way because you're you're always starting the game and mentally it's, it's a very a very different thing um 
but you, you talked a bit about knowing your values and uh, as you get older. I mean, not that you're not at all. You're like 21, I think, Jids. So that's <laughs> That's that's pretty early to be figuring all this stuff out. But we've we've seen a lot of um, athlete activism with Black Lives Matter, and of course Colin Kaepernick a few years ago taking a knee. Megan Rapino did that, um, and uh, you know had a bit of a run in with her federation for taking a knee, and that was back in I think 2017. And then here we are in 2020, and suddenly that uh, uh, movement is really burst back into life and it's become um, really a worldwide thing. Um, you've both shown a lot of, I guess, social conscience around the platform that you have as athletes and um, doing, you know, making not only a financial contribution, but doing things like this, you know, talking to um, people about the good that the game can do and how you use your platform. What what's, um, What is it that, that you see uh, that you can do for the for the world. I mean, you've done so much to become great footballers, making yourselves better, trying to be excellent and be better every single day. Um, how do you think football can make the world better? Um, I'll, I'll sort of start, I guess. I, I think that there's, um, you know, especially in Australia, I don't know around the world exactly what it's like, but in Australia, definitely, um, you know, as, as athletes and as people who are in the public eye it's very easy and we see it with other other sports and other codes how easy it is to forget that you know people are constantly looking at you to see what you do and what you represent and what you talk about um and at the end of the day as hard as you know for for some it might be to to realize that i mean we are sort of role models for some kids um and a lot of kids at the end of the day so i think it is important to to know that and understand that um and for every you know, player in, in other codes, again, what I'm specifically more, more so them than, than us, um, for every bad bit of publicity that, that um, happens, I think there is a lot of players that understand what uh, changes they can support and help, you know, and I think that while all these um, movements are happening around the world, I think it's important for players to understand that we can have just as big a, an involvement in, in, um, in helping and supporting those changes and um, I think that that's the main thing. I think it's understanding, you know, a, a, a um, organization like Common Goal is um, is great because it's found a way of, you know, uniting football as a whole. And that's something that no other sport in the world can do. You know, no other sport has the reach that football has. So I think the more players that we can get involved in something like Common Goal, the more we understand that, um, you know, there's so much support that can be generated from that. Um, to help people all over the world. And I think, so I think there's no other sport like football. And I think it's important um, to try and get as many people within football to join and start doing things like that because um, yeah, no one can, no one has the reach that we have um, and no one can help, you know, facilitate these changes as um, like football can and, and football players and people within within the football community. So that's why, you know, things like this are, are great to be a part of. Kids, do you want to add anything to that? And then and I'm going to come to you and see if you want to add an answer to that question as well, or or if you prefer someone else in, in your team uh, to answer. But first, Kids. Yeah, no, I think Broski said it. Um, it's, it's all about that football does have that worldwide reach. It is the world game and and if we can get players, you know, socially conscious about what is going on in the world and how we can kind of portray that message to everybody else, I think that's something that is going to help. And I mean, look, it's things like Common Goal and things like Football United. You can see how football just connects everybody on such a different level. And and once again, like Broski said, doing things like this, I think if a lot more players got involved in you know, giving back to their own communities and, and kind of bridging that gap between, you know, footballers are up here and everybody else is down here chasing them to just kind of connect everybody back up to, to using the game to kind of fight all together. I think that's that's something that we could all work towards. And do you want to add to that or any of your team? Um, just, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, because I lost you guys. I have no visual, so I've been smiling away at an empty screen. I can't agree with everybody more. Um, the whole reason we started Football United was the power of football. Um, 
I often tell the story of being on the Champs Elysees in 1998 when hundreds of thousands of people were celebrating the victory of the French team. Um, it it rocked my world, and it's my world was never the same since. And I've dedicated the rest of my life to using football, even though I'm not a star, but to trying to get the stars to help engage, like Broski and Alex um, Chidiak have. Um, I think we have a responsibility, and I love to hear that being professed by footballers like the two Alexes, because I don't think all the footballers understand the responsibility they have. And um, when when Broski came on the first 11 um, for Common Goal, um, it was just extraordinary. And he just reinforced to me what an extraordinary person he is. Um, maybe we want to just ask no, because I think no, probably 10 no, because I think she probably feels the same way, um, which is one of the reasons she is where she is with Football United, I think. No? <laughs> Hi. Can you ask? How do you yeah. feel the magic of football? We're having a bit of trouble getting yeah. sound there, I think. I'm now proud and happy to work as a junior project of the game. I think... Yeah. Uh, you hear? Now we can. Not very well. You need to speak loudly. Yep. And can you mute yourself too? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm now proud and happy to work as a junior project officer in 2020 for World United Miela. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, we're very proud to have you on the line and thank you for joining us. Uh, you're, you've got a few dozen lawyers here listening to you and your stories, um, and, and both the Alexes as well. So they have very different lives. They don't get to go out on the green grass very often. Um, although I'm pretty sure that most of the people who are football mad are actually online and, and listening. Um, so it's been really terrific to hear from all of you. Thank you so much for giving us your time and sharing your experiences. Um, to those at Gilbert and Tobin who, um, uh, uh, keen on football um, on workplace there's a thing called football family which you can join up to that group and you'll get you know a steady stream of football news and jokes and whatever else that people send through but more importantly if uh, these stories from football united have inspired you and you'd like to have some further involvement please get in touch we stay in touch with Anne constantly and uh, always trying to find ways in which the firm can help. We do host quite a few of their events, um, except obviously they're now online rather than in, in real time. But as we do get back to the offices, we'll be glad to uh, see Anne and her team um, from time to time. And we're always looking for ways in which we can support them other than through the donation that we make every year um, to help keep things aboard. But we love to involve the people. In the past, we've uh, had all kinds of events. We've had fundraisers. We've had people going to games with uh, some of the Football United kids. We've had people going out to the Saturday morning football in the park. Uh, if that's your thing, there's a lot to enjoy on the field and off it. So if uh, you would like to be part of that, please do send me an email and I'd be happy to uh, round us all up for some more discussions. Uh, there was also a question about the World Cup bid. Um, if you are keen to show your support for that, make sure you sign up as a supporter. So go to As1 2023 and join about 700,000 other people who uh, have expressed support for the bid across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it will be decided on the 25th of June or actually the early morning of the 26th for all of us. And um, fingers crossed that we can get our noses in front of Colombia and Japan and actually bring a senior World Cup here to Australia in 2023 uh, and maybe watch Alex Chidiak bang a few in the net <laughs> against Argentina and everyone else. Um, that's that's a dream that actually keeps you all 
keeps us all awake, I think. So, um, again, a massive thank you to all the Football United crew who've been part of this. I want to acknowledge... Um, uh, ooh, whoops, that wasn't meant to happen. Okay, that, I want to acknowledge Tun Shui as well. He's um, uh, originally from Myanmar. He has worked for Football United for a number of years and has been the architect and grand designer of the project in Myanmar uh, in his home country and made an incredible difference there. Um, and we're all proud of you, Toon. We're proud to have been able to support you over the years and we just can't wait to see all the amazing things that you're going to keep doing for football and for the world. Um, big thank you to Anne. Um, and uh, thanks for all of you at Gilbert and Tobin who've joined. Thank you. Thank you so much.